Hi everyone, this is Kelly Barnhill. Thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you might be. Um, I am here today to talk with you about the specific carbohydrate diet and give you an overview of exactly what that is, what sort of research we have that's out there, um, which clients or whether or not your own child may benefit from this intervention, and how you can do it correctly to maximize response um, to this treatment. So let's go ahead and get started. I have about, we have about an hour here today. I'm going to try to keep my uh, presentation to about 40 to 45 minutes, and I have a lot of information to get through in that time frame. Um, but I encourage you to send questions throughout the time that I'm speaking because I, um, I want to save 15 to 20 minutes to try to get through all of your questions because I know even from the registration information I have, there are many. Um, and if I don't do that, we will do our best to respond to those privately um, after the conclusion of the webinar. I do want to say that we have many, many, many requests noted for this presentation in Spanish. And given that demand, we will do our best to have it translated both from a, a transcript perspective and get that put online and also um, actually translate it and present it in Spanish and hopefully get that onto our YouTube channel in the near future as well. So what is the specific carbohydrate diet? Many of us have heard about it. Um, it is a pro an approach that was developed many years ago in the mid-1900s um, that was based on the work of a physician named Sidney Haas. It was developed by Elaine Gottschall and outlined very specifically in a book called Breaking the Vicious Cycle. This book really is the foundation for this approach, and I would encourage you, if this is something that you're considering, or even considering a variant of this diet, and we can talk a little bit about that later, I would encourage you to start here with this as the foundational information that you use um, to give you more, um, I guess, a baseline knowledge of how to handle this in terms of intervention correctly. So what is it? It was a, an approach first to developed to address chronic bowel disease. So in the 1950s, things such as celiac, ulcerative colitis, later in the 70s when Crohn's disease was becoming an emergent diagnosis. Um, and then in the 1990s, we started seeing families using this to address the bowel symptoms um, of kids with autism. So what are the essential principles of this diet? Well, there's a belief that gastrointestinal dysfunction exists, that that dysfunction impairs the digestion of complex carbohydrates, um, which then um, poorly digested and undigested carbohydrates sit and ferment in the gut, and they feed undesirable intestinal microbes. The overgrowth then of these um, undesirable things occur and this vicious cycle creates inflammation and malabsorption in the intestinal um, system and that continues. So it, it's kind of a self-fulfilling situation um, and it's ongoing without treatment and intervention. So uh, essentially a specific carbohydrate diet would exclude any disaccharide and any polysaccharide. So sucrose, lactose, maltose, anything that requires the breaking of a bond before it can be assimilated and absorbed through the intestinal wall would be eliminated from um, this in this diet. The, that impaired digestion allows time for these large molecules to sit in the gut and act as a substrate so they provide food for bad bacteria um, and fungus that we want not there. So specific carbohydrates to include are monosaccharides, so single sugar molecules, fructose, galact galactose, glucose, anything that's easily and quickly absorbed through the intestinal wall without significant work so that they don't sit there and feed unwanted bacteria. So there is some work out there uh, looking at the use of SCD in autism. 
um, We Band of Mothers, which was published seven years ago uh, by Dr. Baker, Judy Chinnett, um, looking at um, kind of a case study and a case history of the use of specific carbohydrate diet um, in one particular situation. Several pieces that Elaine Gottschall has published, um, and then there are two other um, things published really um, in the past 10 years looking at the specific carbohydrate diet in IBD and also a case series of a dietary trial of SCD in kids with autism published six years ago. So uh, until the past few years really, this was the scope of our research um, and any publication out there on the use of this diet, much less the use of this diet specifically in autism. Recently, um, about two and a half, three years ago, the University of Massachusetts Medical School um, conducted a study looking at a pilot test of a novel diet treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. They called it the IBD-AID. Um, which is uh, derived from the specific carbohydrate diet. So those of us who use the specific carbohydrate diet in practice were really thrilled to see um, that it, it has uh, piqued the interest of some researchers and it, if not implemented strictly in this research approach, it was used as the foundation of this really. Um, so it did in fact eliminate many of the carbohydrates that a specific carbohydrate diet would um, eliminate completely, but it also included the use of uh, pre and probiotics. And notably, um, really from a conclusion perspective, nine of the 11 patients involved were able to be managed without um, anti-inflammatory, anti-TNF therapy, and 100% of the patients involved had their symptoms improved or reduced. Um, and really the outcome is let's look at this in a bigger uh, population because it was a small study of only 11 participants. Last year, Rush University Medical Center looked at the diet in 20 patients with ulcerative colitis and 20 patients with Crohn's. They had, again, 10 of each of those groups followed a diet and 10 ate whatever they wanted. Um, and the conclusion of that work after following those uh, clients for a period of time was that they, um, their outcome measure was primarily uh, gut flora and they uh, acknowledged that patients following an SCD have a different and more diverse microbiome than those who do not follow this approach and only employ traditional pharmaceutical approaches to therapy and intervention. Again, we need to look at this with more um, individuals, and um, but it's promising now that this is emerging research in this community. This was done about two and a half, three years ago. It was a poster presentation at the National Gastroenterology Meeting uh, looking at a case series of kids following SCD in Crohn's disease. And the interesting part about this work is that um, this is really the first time the diet was used and published on in children. Um, so Dr. Burgess is a, a GI specialist there at Stanford um, who uh, learned of SCD and really uh, has been supportive of using it in her practice for kids with IBD. Um, and some and that again, they're still that's an ongoing study and they are looking at it um, across the board with good results. Current work is being done at Seattle Children's Hospital and they actually have an ongoing and open study for children with a diagnosed condition of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Outcome measures that they're looking at in that study um, include activity indices for colitis and Crohn's, so measures of instruments that measure um, activity um, and, and severity of symptoms over time. They're looking at marker laboratory markers such as fecal calprotectin, um, a, a complete blood count, and markers of inflammation such as CRP and ESR, and they're also doing a stool microbiome analysis. They hope to enroll 10 children. Uh, it open, enrollment opened this summer and they hope to enroll the last um, participant in a couple of years time and publish in 2016 
or later. Um, so all of that, uh, particularly the work with children, I think has direct relevance to the population that we serve, um, who many of the kids that I work with have autism. I, I work with many kids on SCD who do not have an autism diagnosis. Um, but I think that as we're trending toward looking at this as a true intervention, um, it is being held um, in higher regard, I guess, as an option for families who want to ameliorate their kids' GI symptoms. So why apply this dietary intervention in autism? Well, it addresses some of the common gastrointestinal complaints that we see our children suffer with. So kids with significant constipation, kids with significant diarrhea, children who are five, six, seven years old and cannot be potty trained because their gastrointestinal symptoms are so severe um, that they need to be um, in a diaper for a, a period of time all day long because it's just not something that they control. Um, in addition to those GI complaints, which was, I believe, the original reason why this was uh, chosen as an approach to start this intervention for kids with autism, and it seemed reasonable to that end, it also, um, after the fact, parents started reporting significant behavioral changes in their children, so improved sleep habits, cognitive gains, increased eye contact, and more socialization and social interaction. So. For both of those reasons, really, um, across the board, to address GI complaints and also with the unusual, out, you know, that behavioral change that is pretty profound in many instances, um, that's why we consider this as a, a, a fundamental nutritional approach in autism for many children. So who are potential candidates for this diet? You know, we see lots of children all over, from all over, who um, have, are on any number of different dietary protocols. So children who are on um, eating what their preferences are only, children who consume inordinate amounts of milk protein, and gluten protein on a daily basis. Children who've been on a gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free, sugar-free diet for years. Children who have been on a fine gold diet. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, particularly during our questions, I hope. Um, but I don't like to see dietary approaches kept in boxes necessarily. I think that a healthy diet is good for all of us. Having said that, candidates for SCD do have a particular profile in m many instances. Um, and the way that we define that as a reasonable inter intervention, first is parental and caregiver willingness to make dietary change. It can be difficult early in this process, but it's, there's a learning curve and you catch on quickly. Children who've been on a different diet, so any number of different allergy elimination diets or intolerance elimination diets with ongoing severe symptoms. Kids who have chronic bowel issues, so profuse diarrhea or terrible constipation. Um, and kids who have altered stool quality, and by that I mean um, kids who come in with, and parents describe repeatedly his stool is sandy or it's gritty, um, it's very mucousy, it's green, it's very sticky, it's hard to remove from the toilet bowl, it clogs the toilet frequently. All of those um, descriptions really define for us characteristics that might be potential, that might indicate a child as a potential responder to this intervention. In terms of behavior, particularly with kids who have been on a prior elimination, but also for children who come in on an unrestricted diet, seeing things like posturing, leaning over furniture, putting lots of pressure on their abdomen, self-injurious behavior is an indicator at often, altered sleep, so kids who have difficulty going to sleep or staying asleep, hyperactivity or significant changes in behavior before and after having a bowel movement. So agitation often prior to having a bowel movement with um, being much calmer afterwards or frankly the inverse, we've seen that too. So um, any uh, of those characteristics really define for us, okay, let's put this at the top of the list of interventions that we're considering. 
So how do you implement SCD, both as a parent and a practitioner who's thinking about it? How do you do it the right way, and how do you um, get the most benefit for your child or the child you're working with from this? If you're a parent, first and foremost, I would say to you, if there's any way possible for you to do this with professional guidance, I strongly encourage you to do so. I understand the financial implications and the issues with um, uh, time, commitment, available resources, etc. I strongly encourage that professional direction from an experienced provider who can hold your hand and walk you through every aspect of this because often there are things that as a parent you might miss that are crucial for the success of this intervention. So really, to begin intervention, I would say you have to assess where you are. So what's the current dietary intake and what's the current supplement intake? Because you will likely be making changes in both of those areas. Understand the stages of SCD. One thing that differentiates SCD from a number of other interventions is the idea that you want to methodically introduce certain foods. This has kind of been... Um, placed in uh, stages or steps of intervention. You need to understand that clearly and why it is um, implemented that way. Also understand that um, moving into a diet that looks like SCD, so uh, restricts to very specific carbohydrates, but doesn't necessarily follow stages, can be a great place to start, but you really want to go back for full healing purposes, if at all possible, and go through an introductory period and limit the diet for, for certain periods of time as you introduce foods and look for response. Uh, you want to find as much supportive documentation to help you. That Breaking the Vicious Cycle book that I've mentioned um, is an incredible resource. Uh, soon, in the next few months, I believe, there'll be another publication out that looks at the use of SCD specifically for children with autism. And the difference there, one of the differences there really, is the use of this approach that limits uh, that eliminates casein protein as well, so without dairy products in this population. And that, uh, Pam Farrow and Raman Prasad, uh, I, I believe it's in publication now and it should be out shortly. And that'll be a great resource available to all of us um, in terms of recipes and guidance as well. You also want to look at support groups, check websites out. There are a number of different options out there. Again, it's always nice if you're a parent to have um, a professional who's responsible for working with you and treating your child to help you navigate some of that information. Um, solely because, I mean, a good example I have is that one of the questions that we received today was about, how, is it possible to do SCDs with also uh, a, believe, a vegan diet? And yes, it is. It's, it's tricky. It's not an easy approach by any means, um, but it can be done with some very targeted and necessary um, additional uh, dietary in inclusions, I guess, and in terms of ratios of intake, et cetera. Um, and you really need a professional to help you do that because you can go on the web and find information on vegan SCD diets, but not all of it, one, is accurate or safe from a dietetic perspective. It's also not uh, technically SCD compliant. And if you're going to make this effort to do something like this, um, that is really, um, it's, it's really necessary for you to be, uh, I guess, as on the ball as possible and hitting the mark. I strongly encourage you not to make that 95% effort um, and, and have that, because a little bit does matter. Um, so, and to that point, this isn't just about nutritional adequacy, really. It's not just a list of legal and illegal foods. It has to be a balanced and appropriate approach. So we have to look at ca total calorie intake, um, lots of fluid intake, uh, the balance of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and it needs to be targeted for the individual. Things that you have to consider both on a personal and a professional level are um, 
are there any food intolerances? So anything that you know your child responds to negatively but isn't a true histamine response allergy, isn't an IgE-mediated allergy, are there any IgE allergies that need to be taken into account? Sometimes we have kids who come in who have significant allergies to egg protein, for example, and we have to navigate um, building an SCD for them um, without the use of any egg protein. Are there any medications involved and how do we make those compliant with the dietary restrictions if at all possible? What about supplements? Any supplement that you're using needs to be SCD legal as well. There's a probiotic concern and there are issues about which probiotic strains are appropriate and which are not um, and that's something that we need to consider. If the child or your child is using any antifungal or antibiotic, how does that play into this approach and where does it fit into the diet? Those are all things that need to be taken in at ground zero as you begin to move forward in this effort. I always like to tell the families that we work with that, um, that there's a lot of troubleshooting that needs to go on here and you need to have your eyes wide open about the potential for die-off, for lack of a better word. It's possible and probable that the child may be very uncomfortable in the first week or 10 days of this approach. I've had more than one family call me and say, my child is running a fever, he's lethargic, he's on the sofa. Um, Watching that happen over and over and over again, um, I, my professional recommendation really is for families to be aware that this might happen and that keeping them hydrated, keeping them um, as healthy and comfortable as possible, looking at this as a, you know, a cold or a flu and treating it as such with lots of time and support, getting through that first seven to ten days can be easy or easier if you have prior knowledge of what it's going to look like. Um, using something called activated charcoal can help. Um, using Epsom salt baths seems to be helpful and supportive and also just fun. Um, and bicarbonate salts also seem to help a little bit in terms of this process over this time frame. So if you wanted to begin this diet initially, what does it look like? During an introductory phased approach, any chicken, turkey, beef, lean pork or game, eggs, any of those proteins can be roasted, boiled or broiled. Um, Ideally, chicken, turkey, or beef broth um, in this time frame, cooked and pureed carrots, so carrots cooked for a, an extended period of time, and then pureed, apple cider, white grape juice, and initially a, 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 a minimal use of fat, um, but just in case it can aggravate um, any ongoing concerns there. So that's what that looks like over a few days' time. With a child, we would never in our clinic go beyond the 72-hour mark with that limited approach. Um, I just don't feel like uh, it's appropriate from a um, nutritional perspective, from a, and, and many of our kids have food pickiness issues. They are um, selective about what they will eat, and if there are caloric intake decreases over this time frame for a short period of time, that's fine. For a longer period of time, it can become problematic. Beyond that, you'd introduce things like applesauce, pear sauce, prepared in a very specific way, which is outlined in Breaking the Vicious Cycle, very ripe, preferably mashed bananas, and then cooked, peeled, and de-seeded zucchini, butternut, and acorn squash. That's where we, those are the next foods that we would want to rotate in. Then you probably would change uh, protein preparation. You can add in more fruits um, prepared as outlined um, in Breaking the Vicious Cycle. You could increase vegetable intake at that time. And perhaps, depending on um, response to the dietary intake and the dietary change, you can start adding homemade nut milks, um, which are a way to boost calories, a way to give kids something that seems familiar, um, and a nice way to introduce 
um, exposure to nut protein as we began to look at bringing in additional nut-based products. So um, as you move along, you can change to pan-frying meats, um, adding in other fruits, um, adding in more vegetables, and then trying another nut product, which is nut butter. So we're gradually building from something that's probably tolerable in a nut in a nut milk form to a probably tolerable in a nut butter form because it's been um, essentially pureed. And then um, as you add, as you look at changing that intake again, you can start thinking about different and variant nut butters and also a different preparation, so a flour. So we're moving up that for lack of a better way to describe it, pre-digested approach. So liquid, mush, um, until something becomes a solid. So in a perfect world, and I want to stress that, you don't put a handful of pecans or cashews in your child's hand before we've tried it in these other formats. That's, you know, we all know the world is not perfect, but in an ideal situation, you stage up in this way much as you would stage through introducing foods to an infant. Finally, you build to a full SCD legal and also expanded dietary approach, which essentially continues to eliminate those um, complex carbohydrates, which we discussed, um, but um, offers a wide variety of meats with a ver wide variety of preparation, um, offers a, a number of different nut products, a number of different fruits and vegetables, and then uh, truly each, that intervention has to be tailored for each individual because as I mentioned earlier, there are kids who may not be able to tolerate certain components of that diet, there might be changes that we need to make, um, but essentially, the other part that's really important to note, both for parents and practitioners, is there is no set rule on how quickly you get to this fully expanded diet either. Um, for some children, this can happen quite quickly. For others, for a number of reasons that you really do need to problem solve, it can take months to get to a place where more foods are tolerated. So how do you introduce those foods that I just quickly walked you through? Um, you must try it slowly and gauge response to each individual food. You want to follow, preferably, those preparation guidelines and procedures outlined in each stage and start with a very small quantity to see if there's a negative response and test it and trial it several times before you include it in your dietary rotation and move on to the next food. So what would a daily menu look like? Um, eight ounces of an allowed fruit juice is reasonable. Some families offer that um, at one meal and that's it. Other families choose to use that um, watered down across the day. That's okay too. I will say that we have many families who come in and say, I don't like fruit juice. I don't want my child to have any fruit juice. I agree with you in many situations. However, in this situation in particular, I will tell you that we like to use fruit juice to boost carbohydrate intake that's legal because we want to make sure our kids are getting enough carbohydrates. This isn't necessarily an approach that um, limits total carbohydrate intake. It, it's about specific carbohydrates and carbohydrate intake is important and often we will have children who will not eat vegetables and using that um, fruit juice, the calories and the carbohydrates from that source helps us increase total carbohydrate intake. Um, it would also include broth, a minimum of eight ounces, ideally more. If you have a child who will drink broth or consume it in a soup or stew based situation, the more broth the better, I think. Approximately three ounces of protein at every meal, uh, vegetables, fruit, and then as you progress to later stages and you've introduced other things, <clears throat> two uh, approximately two nut-based snacks daily. One to three, I think, is the, the given rule. Beyond that, you can see diet, you can see GI change that kind of is hard to tease out as to whether it is um, a negative response to something else or if it's too much um, 
nut consumption. Uh, you don't want to start substituting. One of the mistakes that we see made quite often is once nut flour is a reasonable intake, families start substituting nut flour products across meals all day long for those formerly um, flour-based, grain-based products. So nut muffins for breakfast, nut cookies for snack, nut sandwich bread for lunch, um, and that can be problematic and cause GI difficulty until if you're not far along in this intervention. So what does an enhanced SCD look like? Enhanced SCD, and I use that term, um, means you're including some of the other really good things we as dietitians and nutritionists and practitioners in this area know um, might be useful in um, altering and augmenting a traditional SCD. And I think it's appropriate to talk about that here because many um, many people talk about GAPS, the GAPS diet. Um, and GAPS is, in my mind, and this is not a conversation about GAPS at this point in any way, but GAPS is a kind of a wraparound approach, for lack of a better way to describe it, that includes essentially an SCD-based diet, but also looks at lifestyle changes, dietary intervention, supplements, di detoxification protocols, and it, SCD as a diet um, can include many of those things that are SCD legal, and enhancing that would include focusing only on organic fruits and vegetables if you're using dairy products, um, bringing in raw goat milk, um, using meat only from grass-fed animals, um, choosing natural uh, meat products, beginning to use fermented foods when it's appropriate, um, using bone broths, juicing, and implementing some natural detoxification approaches. That's just a really basic overview on how to enhance what a typical SCD might look like. So all of this really in our focus on a specific carbohydrate diet here at the Johnson Center has evolved over the past decade and it became really important to us because um, I have a clinical practice here, I work with a number of other clinical um, practitioners and I had many, many children coming in on SCD, children coming in asking their parents asking about SCD and there really was no available research to support my recommendation of that intervention. There are other diets that are similar, but SCD has been around for a very long time, and from a logical perspective and from a guidelines perspective, it felt the most um, stringent and also applicable and manageable approach in a lot of ways that had very specific guidelines and very specific associated outcomes. Um, I had the pleasure and the privilege of working with Pam Farrow, who has a, an abundance of knowledge um, on this diet in particular, and working together we were able to create um, a dietary intervention protocol for SCD, get it approved by the IRB, and run a pilot study, which we've just recently completed, that's been in place for the past two years. Um, and I want to share some information with you about that. So it's pre-publication. It has not gone, uh, it has not been submitted yet, and we're still looking at some of the outcome data. But for the practitioners there who want more data and for the parents who want to see some outcome information, I just wanted to go through this quickly with you so that you have kind of a framework um, for thinking through options as to whether this is appropriate or not. So our study, and the specific aim of that study, was to evaluate the application of this diet in children with autism and related disorders. And I wanted to see changes in GI status. I wanted to see what their lab results looked like. I also wanted to look at growth and behavior. So for those outcome measures that you see there, m much of those uh, numbers are identical to um, the outcome measures that are being looked at in the other pediatric studies that are ongoing with the exception that we also wanted to look at anthropometric measurements and any behavioral changes. So we enrolled 20 kids over two years um, and they were between the ages of two and six. We enrolled children here in Austin, Texas and also at Hopewell Associates in Massachusetts. 
Um, we also had some clients followed by Vicki Koblener, who practices in Connecticut, because we had several children enroll in the Pennsylvania and New York area, and she tracked um, their anthropometric measurements for us for the children who were in that area. Inclusion criteria were documented evidence of kids with GI symptoms. As we talked about, um, those symptoms are, are varied. So it could be diarrhea or constipation, pain, um, failure to thrive, mucus in the stool, blood in the stool, uh, GERD, uh, a history of reflux, um, or a fatty stool. Um, and they could not be a participant in another therapeutic trial. In addition, the parent or caregiver had to be on board with the pretty specific requirements that we um, needed to make sure that this was successful. And those are the kids that we included. We had a number of things that could have complicated the study. So um, the kids, the children who we could not serve were kids who had any infectious colitis testing, any child who had followed an SCD or was currently on SCD, anyone with a metabolic disorder, a genetic disorder, or any other uh, concurrent physical, mental, or neurological disorder that would have precluded participation in our assessments, um, and any child who was either on a new psychiatric medication or was receiving um, enteral or parental IV nutrition um, in that time frame. So we wanted to verify diagnosis of all of our participants to confirm that, in fact, they had an autism spectrum disorder, and each child went through a number of different uh, screens. We used the SCQ, the ADIR, the PDDBI. We also asked families to fill out a sleep habit questionnaire, a Vineland, and a sensory profile. Additional information that we gathered before we ever began intervention was lab measures, anthropometric measures, a comprehensive three-day food diary, and a gastrointestinal inventory questionnaire. So um, we've completed and publication is pending. We had 20 subjects enrolled um, beginning in April of 2012. 17 of those subjects completed the treatment phase as of April of 2014. Two subjects were removed from the study during the treatment phase, and one subject was enrolled, but due to severe um, selectivity, was unable to move forward in the study. And what did our kids look like, the kids that we served in this way? There were 16 boys and four girls. Um, 16 children who enrolled had a BMI of 45th percentile or higher, and we had one child at the 11th percentile, so none of the kids that we served met failure to thrive criteria. We enrolled 10 children in Massachusetts and 10 children here in Texas. And so what do we do? Um, we chose so that we could control the food the child was eating to prepare and provide all meals for children for four months. So we used organic and to the extent it was possible, local food provided for 16 weeks, prepared at a commercial facility. Our menus were tracked and evaluated on a weekly basis by a clinician either at Hopewell or here at the Johnson Center. We attempted an introductory diet, which I reviewed with you earlier. Um, most of the children that we worked with were able to successfully participate with an introductory phase. A few were not. Um, and then a sample menu of the kids that we worked with looks something like this. So bone broth, grass-fed beef, egg noodles, pureed vegetables, chips, um, pureed fruits, and nut flour and nut butter cookies. Um, but there were really a number of different things that we had to work with, and each menu was prepared based on the dietitian or the clinician's specific um, requests and recommendations for the child's intake based on their prior week's intake. So we would meet with families on a weekly basis and talk about response to different foods, GI status, behavior, um, and then have the opportunity to kind of change, alter, and choose the next steps in terms of foods to introduce. At that nutrition appointment, we manage weight changes because we ask families to weigh the child once a week on a, the same scale which we provided during that time frame. Um, we had a menu plan in place. Um, we had anecdotal reports um, 
that parents provided for us. So some of the information that we collected in each of those meetings was quantified and um, data driven really and some of it was tell us about X, Y, and Z and we took all of that note in great detail for each client that we worked with. Um, I want to share now two kids who enrolled with us and kind of give you a case history for clinicians to kind of think through but also for parents to think if you're sitting there thinking my child will never ever eat this food, do this, be successful. I wanted to give you a few profiles so that you see it can be done. Um, so this child enrolled, he'd been tracked for a P, by a PDGI um, for a number of months for severe gastrointestinal concerns. He was a nonverbal 28-month-old 28 28 who also happened to be a twin. He had significant sleep disruption, self-injurious behavior, and significant repetitive behaviors. His diet, when we enrolled him, was very strict. It includes, included French toast sticks, Cheez-Its, Dunkin' Donuts, cheddar cheese bagel twists, potatoes. It was, it was carb heavy. Lots and lots of um, Gerber, Gerber pureed baby food. The only f uh, protein that they were getting in at this time was organic bologna and uh, milk products. So mom was using Pediasure um, to bolster his protein, fat, and calorie intake. Um, there was a little bit of uh, vegetable going in, but it was all in the form of baby food and lots of whole wheat pasta with um, sauce. So that's, that was his baseline. And we began treatment about 18 months ago, almost two years ago, um, and he had significant food refusal. Like for the first introductory period where we tried to transfer and transition to this diet was quite difficult. The tracking clinician ended up talking with the family pretty much hourly over that period of time. The parents were very upset. Um, however, within 48 hours of compliance of this intervention, the mom reports that she heard him say, Mommy, Daddy Ball. He had been nonverbal until that time. He had a low-grade fever. Um, and really, the only food he would eat in that window of time was pureed apples and pear sauce and maybe some soup. By day seven, he'd gained a pound after being um, somewhat stuck for a period of time. He was having two huge bowel movements every day. He was sleeping through the night. And the pediatrician who was involved said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So it was slow, it was hard, but it was done, and it had good results in the end. Another child I wanted to profile for you is a, a little boy whose primary source of food was milk protein. He consumed a lot of fluid milk every day and a lot of cheese crackers, cheese pizza, and cheese. The parent reports that um, he had unformed and malodorous stools. He wasn't potty trained, and he had lots of loose stools every day. Even at his age, he had never learned to sleep through the night. They had great difficulty. He screamed, and he had significant, clearly, food selectivity and preferences. He was difficult to transition to the diet. He refused all protein. The few foods that he would eat were almond crackers and fruit and celery. He spoke his first words, though, on day four. Dad, you are on the porch, he said. And in preschool that week, he said, hang up backpack. So we know something's happening here. Um, his stools also started to improve. They were semi-formed. They, um, they were more brown. And by the third week of this approach, they lacked the odor that mom felt was so significant as he started. His sleep improved, um, and by the first month on this diet in week four, mom reported that there were glowing reports from school and therapists. Everyone was excited about his language development. And clearly, nothing else was changing um, in terms of intake, medication, environmental change, because we tried to control for those variables as much as possible. So looking at the outcome measures that we established now, um, our families had to fill out, graciously filled out, 
a stool questionnaire every day over the course of the intervention. They filled one out at baseline and then for the four months that they participated in the study, they gave us answers to stool status questions every day. Um, and three of those responses showed a significant change um, over that window of time. So stool color normalized, stool size and form per the Bristol scale um, normalized, and constipation and the effort required to pass a stool became more normal in that time frame. The other things that we um, queried were in that uh, same instrument were um, Parental reported hyperactivity seemed to decrease, it did decrease significantly, and parental reported irritability decreased over that window of time. Um, the other measures that we looked at uh, are still in process of evaluation, and we are hoping to have things together and finalized and ready to submit for publication in the coming weeks. Um, I want to give um, thanks to everyone um, on this list that you see here, the team who worked on this study, our advisors, Jill James and Paul Ashwood, our friends who were very helpful as we began this, Martha Herbert, everyone at ARI, including Peter Cohen and Liz Lipsky and Tom Maltair. And now I'll open it up. We have, um, I have about 10 minutes here, I think, before we need to uh, close things off. I can go longer um, if, it, if it's required. I have a few more minutes, um, but I'm really happy to kind of respond to individual questions if necessary and, and get you at least some beginning information um, as soon as I can uh, via email beyond this. <clears throat> so uh, um, the first question I really want to speak to is what's the difference in the specific carbohydrate diet and all those other diets out there? So what's the difference in SCD and paleo and what's the difference in SCD and GAPS and what about modified Atkins and SCD? And um, again, I, I feel like in thinking about this and, and parsing the information in each of these situations, with SCD and GAPS, the dietary components are very similar. The differences are that SCD focuses on a managed intervention and speaks to very specific exclusions in terms of supplementation as well. A, a paleo approach might do some but not all of that. I have clients who begin SCD, follow SCD, and then transition off and follow a paleo approach uh, by introducing and, and um, following that um, approach. Uh, with different probiotics or different supplementation, for example. Um, what about modified Atkins? Modified Atkins and SCD fit nicely together, frankly. Um, the difference is that Atkins sets, um, doesn't really set a limit on which types of carbohydrates you can use, and it does set a limit on the total number of carbohydrates that you can have. Um, it is possible to do, I mentioned this earlier, it is possible to do SCD while vegan um, uh, and vegetarian. Uh, my preference and, recommend, and strong recommendation would be get professional guidance to do that safely because there can be issues, and I have seen them and we've worked with them with kids who um, have some dietary deficiencies when they're trying to pair several uh, different approaches together. It can be done. I would just find a knowledgeable professional to do that with you. Um, the next question I have is, is SCD appropriate for candida overgrowth in autistic children? Yes, um, that's part of that um, GI dysbiosis that I mentioned, um, and that's one of the reasons that we implement this. So if there is a candida situation that needs to be addressed, this um, absolutely is one primary intervention that many practitioners choose. Um, the next question is, tell me about SCD versus GAPS versus yeast-free. Again, GAPS and SCD very similar. Yeast-free is a bit different um, and looks at um, a more strict elimination of a number of different sugars. Um, and it can be overlapped and be successful with SCD. But typically, when you're working with a child, I tell parents, let's focus on this one first and layer in that one later if we need to. Um, 
in the GAPS diet, there are phases before you start a full GAPS program. That's the same, that's very much like an SCD staged approach. Um, <clears throat> SCD does require a staged approach on the way in that I hope I outlined um, there. Ideally, you follow those stages, which are much like those uh, GAPS phases. Um, and there is, uh, you know, the, the follow-on question to that is, is there a disadvantage to starting, um, to not starting very simply? And the answer is absolutely not. You want to start as simply as possible with this intervention. How do you locate a professional to help with this diet? I am more than happy to help you find local resources in your area. If that is your question or if that's something that you're interested in doing, if you email us at info at johnson-center.org, I can help you um, do that. What is the best cow milk replacement when implementing SCD um, in terms of yogurt? Honestly, if you're avoiding um, cow's milk casein, I would say that um, any casein would not be my first preference, particularly if you're working with a child with autism. And you can look at making nut milk yogurt in much the same way, but I would caution you to do that only when you reach the appropriate time to introduce those nut-based foods. Um, the alternative is introducing uh, raw goat's milk yogurt, which um, many kids with autism cannot tolerate even in the tiniest amounts and you really do want to introduce it in teeny tiny amounts if at all possible. Um, but if you're treating um, UC or uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, then I would um, say that it's quite possible that you're able to um, implement that successfully, but again, in very small amounts. Um, and there are a number of different resources that are available locally now, and it's regionally, and it's growing daily, frankly. So I think that finding that as an option, if it's something you choose to add to your diet, shouldn't be that difficult. How do you allow fruit juice, since it contains carbohydrate, and it's supposed to generate the growth of GI microorganisms? Excellent question. I know it's counterintuitive. I know it has, it's essentially straight fructose. I know, I know all of those things. I also know that I need it as a simple carbohydrate to bolster total carbohydrate intake initially. Um, it, it's much like, the, it's the same question we get, how can this diet, how can you have honey on this diet if it's sugar and it's going to feed the problematic um, concerns? And I, I, as we shift um, the, the makeup of the flora in the GI tract, these things are of less concern and are well tolerated, I think is the best answer I can give you to that question. My son has rejected meat since he was an infant. Now he is a vegetarian who relies heavily on grains and dairy and eats very few vegetables. How would you recommend this diet work with a 15-year-old teen? I think you would need his buy-in. I don't know. Um, he, he would have to be a part of this to make this successful, I would think, um, if he has very specific preferences. If he, does, um, if he does not, I would start introducing some of the newer foods on this approach and then choose the time frame after he's accepted some newer foods to eliminate the old ones. And that's something really that I think a professional could work with you on creating that time frame and creating that plan and hopefully include him in that as well. How do you know that there that any improved symptoms are not just the result of a gluten and casein free diet, which the SCD is? Um, I think that's a very good and very valid question. I also think that um, the bulk of the kids who we saw significant changes in had been on a gluten and casein free diet, um, both in the study and also outside the study clinically, frankly. Um, those are kids who have already eliminated those proteins from their diets for a significant period of time. The two kids that I profiled for you, um, that very well, you're absolutely right in pointing that out, um, but it was consistent across a number of children and the majority of children who had already eliminated gluten and casein from their dietary intake. Did any of your participants have Prater Willie? No, it was an exclusion criteria for the study. Do any of our clinical clients have Prater Willie? Absolutely. 
our 15-year-old son is on a GS, GF, CF, SF diet. He is monitored. What is the difference in this and SCD? Um, it is a, 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 it includes complete, the, the simplest answer I can give you here is that it is a complete elimination of any grains, any complex carbohydrates that the child is eating, and many, many of the foods that are allowed on a gluten casein soy free diet are not allowed on a specific carbohydrate diet. A specific carbohydrate diet, when done well, is really the bare bones. So healthy, lean meats, good quality fats, fruits, vegetables. My daughter was on SCD after, and after six months had normal bowel movements. At her first day at school, she got a golden gram cereal and has had loose bowels ever since. I'm so sorry. Any ideas on how to get her bowel back to normal? Her diet has not changed. Um, there are a number of, I think, troubleshooting things that you could think about to address this. Uh, if you're working with a practitioner, I would talk to the, I, I would think about um, utilizing things like the Epsom salts that we mentioned. Uh, bicarbs of, uh, bicarbonate might be helpful. Um, activated charcoal, any digestive enzymes might be helpful. And I know that her, this was a one-time exposure, and it can take weeks. To, to resolve and ameliorate from, but um, those are all kind of supportive measures I think you could use. Um, do you count carbs when following an SCD? Uh, my answer is yes and no on that one. Yes, I want to make sure that you're hitting a threshold of healthy carbohydrate intake. No, I don't have a level that you can't go over. Um, so technically speaking, when most uh, people follow an SCD, once they have the hang of it, it's not something that you necessarily need to track. But we track it pretty explicitly for a period of time because I want to make sure we're getting enough carbohydrates in and not causing any problems by not doing so. When can other foods be introduced, and um, i.e., is SCD a lifetime decision? For some people, it is. For some people, they just choose an SCD or a modified, which is not my favorite word ever, but a modified approach might be more like a paleo diet where you're using um, SCD legal foods, but um, including some additional things occasionally as well. Some people transition nicely off um, after six months or two years. Um, it just it, It's really an individualized decision based on response to the dietary intervention. Does vitamin K need to be on board when you're following SCD? Vitamin K needs to be on board for all of us. If you're talking about adding supplemental vitamin K, that really depends on that dietary analysis that I mentioned, what level of, diet, uh, of vitamin K is coming in that way. Um, I like to see most of our clients and people that I work with on an SCD legal multivitamin anyway that should have some level of vitamin K in it, but there are clients who we do need to put on a standalone um, vitamin K supplement as well to make sure that their needs are met. Are soy or rice milk products allowed to replace casein products? on SCD. They are not. Soy and rice milk are not legal uh, for this dietary approach. Should I stop all supplements when I start SCD and, and introduce them gradually? Again, there are different approaches to this. Uh, I would think that the way you want to um, think about it would be um, transitioning to SCD legal supplements initially, so making sure that everything that your child is on, working through the ingredients in each product that the child is on, if it's been tolerated for some time, his current supplementation schedule, then I would make sure those things are SCD legal or switch to similar products that are, make sure that there's a baseline there, and then move into the diet. For families who are on a number of supplements that aren't easily translated to an SCD legal approach, being on those things can complicate the picture. Um, and so I would say that stopping some of them for a period of time and reintroducing is probably the best approach. Um, I think I have about one more minute here. I've gotten several questions that I haven't been able to get to yet. Um, 
what about grilled meats? My child will only eat grilled meats. Again, this speaks to perfect world um, scenario. You don't start with grilled meats. Um, you start with those preparation um, criteria and procedures that I outlined for you. But if grilled meats are the only way to go and you're doing it safely, um, then I would say, yes, we, we start there and we accommodate. Um, this is one of those uh, clinical decisions, I think, that we have to make on an ongoing basis about risk benefit. And I would say that if you feel like your child is a potential responder to this intervention, I would not say don't do it if you can't transition initially from grilled meats to other preparations. Um, last question. Um, how do, how do working folks manage highly physical jobs with the caloric constraints here? Some of the financial constraints uh, of adhering to the diet can also impact compliance. Um, I think those are valid. That's a valid concern. Uh, financially speaking, this can be done relatively easy. The, the trade-off is time because much of this is prepared on a daily basis or a weekly basis, and getting into the hang of that preparation schedule can be difficult. Um, but the cost of the raw materials and your ingredients um, isn't, uh, is comparable, really. And we've done several webinars on how to do dietary elimination protocols um, with uh, minimal in, uh, finance financial resources and um, spending reasonable amounts of money and spending the same amount of money that you would on other products. And really, it's comparable to how most of um, many people eat. Um, so I wouldn't let the financial criteria be a barrier initially. Um, in terms of caloric constraints, there really aren't caloric constraints. Um, and there aren't carbohydrate constraints in terms of total carbohydrate for energy intake. It's just a different carbohydrate intake than we are typically used to. So I think I need to leave it there. Um, I see a number of additional questions that have come in, and I will do my best to get answers to you or responses to you as I can. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Um, and. Um, Nisi Webb will be forwarding to you question, uh, a link for those questions later today. Thank you so much.